All right. Hello, everyone. We've got a nice little group. Thanks for joining us at our last Green Living Seminar presentation of this semester. Um, I'm Elena Traster, professor in the Environmental Studies Department here at MCLA. And as many of you know by now, this semester's series of free public Green Living Seminar talks was organized around the theme, Greening the City. So you can find links to the recordings of all the previous presentations on our website at www.mcla.edu slash greenliving, one word. Our presentation today will last around half an hour or so with then an opportunity to ask questions. So save all your questions and we'll get to have a little discussion at the end. Um, and so um, I'm so very happy then to introduce um, today's speaker. We have um, Nick, Nick, Nicholas Russo from the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. He's a senior transportation planner there, um, speaking on bicycling in the Berkshires, uh, history and future. Thanks so much. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's, I've been looking forward to this for a while. It's super exciting. So really glad to be here. Um, yeah, my name is Nick. I'm a transportation planner at Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. Grew up here in the Berkshires in Pittsfield. Um, lived here my whole life, basically, except for going to college. So it's been really cool to be working in my own backyard and, and trying to make it a better, greener place. So I'm happy to share a lot of what I've learned about bicycling infrastructure and, and culture and how we can bring more of that to Berkshire County, because I think it's it's super important in the whole context of sustainable sustainability in terms of both in, in terms of all of environmental, social, and economic bottom lines of sustainability. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. First, kind of where, we're, where we've gotten to at this point with the Ashwood's Cook Rail Trail. That's kind of our big um, centered poster child of bicycle infrastructure in Berkshire County. How we got up to this point where we're at now, what we see down the future for the Ashwood's Cook. And then I'm gonna kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about how to encourage a future of bicycling culture and infrastructure just across all of Berkshire County that plays off of the rail trail and helps to connect everything in a more bicycle friendly way. So we kind of, oh, spoilers. So we kind of know this image maybe um, from Norman Rockwell. He painted this in the 1970s, a view of downtown Stockbridge. Um, it's very kind of idealistic, kind of uh, very green, maybe a nice spring day a few weeks from now, you'd see this kind of scene. Um, and he chose to include some people taking their bikes out for a ride down Main Street in Stockbridge. Um, this was probably like in the mid 1970s um, when he took this scene. And so I kind of made a little uh, modern interpretation of what it might look like today. You know, we've got signs that remind you how to ride your bike. You know, we've got people probably waiting behind you to try and to try and swerve around you as you ride your bike down the middle of the road with your with your high vis vest and your helmet and your flags to make sure people are safe and make sure people see you and you're following the letter of the law. So, you know, it's not quite as idealistic as maybe Norman Rockwell viewed it in the 1970s. Um, but where can, we, where can we go from there? What would our future look like from this point? You know, because in, in my opinion, I think this could be improved upon a little bit. Um, so let's start with what the Asheville to Cook Rail Trail offers to Berkshire County. We'll talk a bit about its history, its present state, and then its future. Um, this might be, this might even been a scene that Norman Rockwell painted if he was around today. This is a beautiful site right um, at Cheshire Lake, and I, I love to sit there and, and watch the, duck, the ducks go by and <laughs> see the mountains out in the distance. So it's it's definitely another iconic Berkshire scene, I think, created by this this new rail trail. So let's see, did we get it? All right. So way back, ancient history was when this rail corridor was first developed back in the mid 19th century by the Pittsfield and North Adams Railroad. Um, they first developed this corridor and it was eventually bought by New York Central um, who upgraded it to um, offer services to many of the limestone companies that were along the line. Think of specialty minerals, <clears throat> which is still using the rail line today. And then by the 1980s, um, the line was sold to the Boston and Maine Railroad and within that same decade, service had been abandoned between Pittsfield and Adams as, as demands diminished for that, for that rail line. Um, and from that point, 
some visionary folks first saw that this rail line, this corridor should be preserved and it could be a very important connector for another purpose, like a rail trail. So in the mid 90s, um, the first feasibility study for preserving and converting this, this rail line into a bike path was submitted to the state. And by 2001, ground was broken on the first segment of the actual to cook from the Pittsfield town line to um, Cheshire Lake. And not long after that, the second segment from Cheshire Lake to downtown Adams was finished. And then after a very long hiatus, the next northern extension from Adams uh, was completed up to Lime Street, which is where it still terminates today. And from that point, it actually deviates from the rail line a little bit since that part is still in operation. So it kind of meanders along the river. And that's the plan going forward is to have it kind of follow the river more than the rail line itself. <clears throat> so where are we now in the present day? So presently, there have been 187,000 users counted entering the trail since July 1st, 2020. There have actually been counters installed on either end of the rail trail that can, that can tell when someone goes in and out. So that's how many have been detected just since 2020. Of course, the trail's been open for 20 years prior to that. So there's been uncountable number of people who have, who have used this trail and visited it for all kinds of reasons. We're at 14 miles total in length of the paved trail, you know, for any use like jogging, cycling, um, hiking, and dog walking. And currently there are connections in planning or under construction, um, including the Lee Bikeway, the Mohawk Trail, um, Bike Hike Trail in Williamstown, which is under construction right now, um, the Adventure Trail, which will come in from the Williamstown side into North Adams, is um, currently under feasibility study. Um, and those are all going to make one kind of big corridor, which we'll look at in a second. Um, and of course, this is a, a, a new way to access parts of the county that were um, previously not accessible. And it can be, it's open to all ages and abilities, whether you're riding a, a, a bicycle, a hand cycle, a trike, um, just jogging, walking, anybody can access this trail, which I think is, is very unique. So if down in the future, just um, coming up very soon, is the first southern extension since the trail was first opened. Um, the southern extension will be going into Pittsfield from the Berkshire Mall down to Crane Ave. Um, we can look at that on a map in a second for those who aren't familiar with the geography. And from there, the next extension, just kind of a little half mile jog, will be added onto that in the next few years, which will bring the trail down to Crane Ave, or sorry, Merrill Road in Pittsfield. And that's kind of the, the current terminus since from that point you hit the main line rail, which is still in operation. So there'll be some more options to look at from there that we can talk about. Um, then going back north by 2026, um, pre uh, predicted this next extension from Lime Street into downtown North Adams, or sorry, from Lime Street to Hodges Cross Road is planned for construction commencement. And then from there, from Hodges Cross Road into downtown North Adams is still to be determined, but that's the logical next step to then connect this entire corridor. Um, but that's still kind of to be determined for funding and a, a, a groundbreaking date. Um, as some of my colleagues have said, all the easy parts of the trail are done. So these, are, these next parts are going to be the most challenging in terms of infrastructure, logistics, and funding um, since we don't have the rail bed anymore to work with. So it'll take a little more planning. It'll take a little more involvement from other entities, but we'll get it done. <laughs> it'll just take a little bit more time, I'm sure. So then in this, we can think of this, think of this geographically. The green line is what is, exists today, the 14 miles I mentioned. Um, the two sets of magenta lines on the south and the north, those are the two next extensions that are going to be slated to begin um, in Pittsfield down to Crane Ave and Merrill Road, and then in Adams from Lime Street to Hodges Cross Road. The yellow, tr the yellow line is a combination of the northernmost extension of the rail trail and then the adventure trail that is um, currently under feasibility study. And then the other pink line is the Williamstown Mohawk Trail that's currently under construction. And I believe that's slated to open um, this coming, or next summer. Um, but that could accelerate if, if construction continues. Let's see. Okay. So then a quick little note about how shared use paths actually work. Because it's a little bit more than just slapping down some asphalt on, on the ground. <laughs> so in order to make it a high quality experience for everyone to use, you need to follow a certain kind of 
a certain number of standards. For instance, um, Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, um, there's a certain threshold of slope that uh, the trail should follow to be accessible, including the, the cross slope and the, the longitudinal slope to allow water to drain off the side. Um, most modern trail designs have a shoulder on either side, which is usually just gravel, somewhere to pull off if you have to you know, fix a tire or answer the phone, or even if you're just learning to ride and need a little extra space in case you, in case you lose control. Um, most of the trails in Berkshire County are asphalt, though crushed stone is another attractive option that's a little bit cheaper. Um, sometimes it's called um, uh, crusher run limestone. And it's usually just like a very, very fine stone powder that can be laid down as well for a little bit less expense than asphalt and works very well. Um, and then barriers, of course, if you're running near private property, near a bridge crossing or other kind of drop off, um, those can be useful to keep people on the trail. So that's kind of the anatomy of what a shared use path is like. If you're ever out, or out in other parts of the state, you know, Northampton has some great examples, um, Albany, Troy, um, the Albany Hudson Electric Trail just opened last year, which is a really great route from Albany all the way down to Hudson. Part of it's on-road, part of it's off-road, um, but it, it utilizes a, an old trolley line. So it's kind of like the Asheville to cook. Um, it's a very nice ride. <laughs> so I'll transition now from the Asheville to cook itself into kind of the bigger picture about what bicycling infrastructure and culture could be like in Berkshire County and what I've seen are the, the big pieces to making that reality in other parts of, of the world and of the country. So the way I see it is that there's a, a bunch of pieces that need to fit together to make a bicycling future more sustainable. And that includes incentives to get people riding, complete streets and safe systems so people feel safe, and a, a, a better interplay between land use and transportation because those two are inextricably, inextricably linked with each other. Land use begets transportation use and what choices people have to get around. So we'll kind of just talk about each one in a little bit more detail. Um, so in terms of land use and transportation, it really just starts from the ground up. You know, any number of factors can determine the level of investment that's needed to make cycling an attractive option. And you might hear that a place can't have a sizable cycling population because it's too cold or too hot, too hilly or uh, too rainy, too windy, um, or if it's too crowded even, you know, all the space we have is used. We can't give any more of it over. Um, and a lot of those arguments just don't hold water when you, when you realize that the number one factor for determining how many people are cycling in a city or in a, in a state is just the level of investment in high quality bike infrastructure. So even if it's, you know, even if it's cold some of the year, even if, if it's wet some of the year, you know, people can wear different layers of clothes. They can, you know, wear, <laughs> wear a rain, raincoat. But if there's a safe place to ride in these more extreme conditions, that will get people out on a bike more than just if the weather is nice all year round. Um, so it's not just that it's a culture thing. It's really up to making decisions about land use and transportation options and investments. And all these different things play into that. What is the density of where you live? What are the housing choices? Is it, you know, is it, multi-family units or is it mostly just single family kind of spread out? What kinds of subdivisions are there? Is there mostly cul-de-sacs and dead ends or is there connectivity between different neighborhoods that doesn't necessarily require you to go on a, a major arterial road? Um, what kind of parking is available? Like are there lots of empty parking lots all the time that could be repurposed or is there uh, quality bike parking available? Um, what kind of zoning is offered? You know, are there opportunities for high density multifamily units um, that are more precluded to having, um, you know, bike, biking be a, a good option. And what functional classifications, is just a fancy way of saying what kind of roads do you have in your community? Are they mostly big fast arterial roads? Are they small local neighborhood roads? Those kinds of things. Determine what sorts of investments you need to make in bicycling infrastructure. So an example of that, um, in terms of all these things I kind of just listed off, like what is your land use and what types of land use will allow cycling to be a better choice. Um, you know, if you say you want to go to the grocery store in each of these neighborhoods, what are your choices? So on the right, you know, say you live up in, up in this neighborhood here. 
and you want to get to the grocery store down here. Well, you have a few options. You could go down the main road, you could go on a side street, you could meet in the middle. And any of those options could be by foot, by bus, by car, by bike. Um, contrasted with, say, if you live in a, in a land use like this, where mostly cul-de-sacs, things don't connect to each other, and you want to get to the store up on the main road here. So your main option is really just going to be to take this one type of road. <clears throat> and odds are this, this, this route is going to be made by a car. And that's not any fault of the neighborhood, you know. I'm sure it's a very nice neighborhood to, to jog around, to take your bike around and enjoy the outdoors. But practically speaking, um, you know, it's going to be tough to bring a bus through here you know, to make all these, to make all these the winds and turns. Um, if you're going to be going anywhere to go to work, to go to the store, you're probably going to be getting on this freeway over on the right. So these are, uh, these are choices that were made about how to best use this land. This is exclusively residential, whereas over here is more mixed use, a little higher density. So it'll take a different level of investment to make cycling uh, an attractive option in this area versus that area is kind of what I'm, I'm planning to get at. <laughs> so in terms of, um, so in terms of infrastructure, you know, a lot of people might say that if you live in an area like this, it's not very worthwhile to invest in high quality bike infrastructure um, because it's going to be really, really tough to get people to, in mass, ride to ride their bikes to places like work, to the store, to the to to friends' houses. So the most, the, the best kind of infrastructure you'll end up with is probably things like this, you know, narrow bike lanes just kind of shoehorned in on the side of the road, sharrows that just kind of indicate that, yes, you are allowed to be there, as is the law anyway. <laughs> or I heard someone mention before, there's bike lanes just that people, you know, drive over anyway, because it's not actually separated from the road. So these kinds of investments are usually what people think of when you hear biking infrastructure. And these aren't really going to attract anyone new to ride here that probably wasn't already riding here in the first place, because it really doesn't make that big of a, a change. You know, there's no separation from moving traffic. There's no really protection from noise, smog, pollution, water. Half of this bike lane is basically the gutter, as a, as a YouTuber I like to follow calls it the painted bicycle gutter, because if it's raining, that's going to fill up with water, and then you're just basically in a puddle. So my goal is to get away from this idea of biking infrastructure and show that there can be more and more targeted investments that are a, a bigger impact than maybe just putting down paint, a lot of paint. You might see it a lot, but it really doesn't make that big of an impact. Um, because everyone, I think, in my opinion, everyone who sees these thinks it's, you know, kind of undignified almost. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it, it kind of it reinforces this notion that if you're on a bike, then you're kind of just forced to be here. You don't want to be here. You know, you don't have a driver's license. You know, you, you, you know, this poor person needs to get in a car. <laughs> and that's, that, I think that's kind of the signals that these kinds of, this kind of bike infrastructure gives. Um, but retrofitting can work if it's done well. And I think this is a good example in um, Natick over in the eastern end of the state. Um, up in the top right corner is the Cochituit Rail Trail, um, which is basically like the Asheville to Cook Rail Trail. It's a converted rail line. And recently they've built this new spur trail. It's kind of hard to see maybe with the, the contrast, but um, this red line here is a new spur trail that runs off of the rail trail right to the front door of the Natick Mall. And there's covered bike parking right there at the front door. And you're fully separated from traffic for this entire trip. You know, you ride alongside, off in the separated path. There's beautiful, like, plantings and trees to keep you out of the, the noise and the, the fumes from traffic. Um, not so much for the sidewalk, but I'm sure most people probably just use this path anyway. <laughs> I mean, you could have easily just slapped a bike lane here, probably, put some sharrows in. But I don't, think, I don't think that would have attracted anybody who wasn't already going to ride there. But now, you've got this beautiful separated pathway that gets you right to the front door of the mall in just as safe and elegant of a fashion as if you drove there and parked in the parking lot. So these kinds of investments can work in more suburban and rural places, I think, when it's targeted and there's a concerted effort to 
give bike users the same experience as someone driving to the mall, for instance. Um, the trail character is maintained all the way to the front door is another point. Um, and that can really make a difference for getting people to get to their final last mile by a bike, as opposed to maybe driving to the trail and parking and unloading their bike and then riding. Because that would be, that, I think that would be a game changer, is to get people to ride all the way to a trail, all the way from the trail, first and last mile, would be, I think, really, really great to connect more places around Berkshire County. <coughs> and at the end of the day, the investments we make in cycling infrastructure are a statement of our values. And if we say that we want to value the bicycle as a mode of transportation on equal footing with others driving, you know, taking the bus, taking the train, then our investment needs to match that of the others. And sometimes that will require doing more, going above and beyond just, you know, painting bike lanes or putting in sharrows. Um, you know, in a, in a more car-oriented land use like this around the Natick Mall, you know, you've got your Home Depot there, you've got your gas station, you know, it's, it's your classic suburban land use. Um, but the, the planners of these trails have decided that people who ride their bikes can get just as good an experience as someone driving to the store. So like this bridge here is not a highway on-ramp. It's not, it's not an overpass from a bolt, like a, a highway. This is a new uh, overpass for a bike trail. And it gets people off the road, separated, without even having to stop and think about it. There is an intersection down here. You can maybe see like the traffic lights down here. You know, we could have easily have just said, okay, send them to the crosswalk, make them cross the street, and then you can get back on the trail. Um, but they decided to go in a different direction and make this investment that shows that you can cycle to the mall. You can cycle from your neighborhood to the Home Depot, to the mall, to the restaurants, to work. And this will make that possible. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, land use and transportation have to come together. And I think that there are a lot of ways to do that. So thinking about safe systems now, how do we make it safer, a safer choice for people to ride? Um, a lot of industries use what they call the hierarchy of controls, which is a way to gauge how different um, interventions make the workplace safer for employees. Um, it's inverted because the least effective but easiest investment is at the bottom, and the most effective and highest reaching investment is at the top. So this can also be applied to um, cycling. This is a good graphic made by, uh, not, not me, this is a different, um, Copenhagen Eyes is a really good uh, network if you're interested in learning more. <laughs> um, so we can talk about you know, the hierarchy of controls in terms of urban cycling. So at the bottom of the pyramid is PPE, personal protective equipment. Your helmets, your high-vis vests, your, your flags. In the middle is administrative controls, which is things like speed limits and enforcement of those. Getting towards the middle are engineering changes, like bike lanes, speed humps, signs, roundabouts, traffic signals, things that make traffic slow down. As you get higher, you have substitution, more options for transportation, more public transport, buses, trains, and more options to bike. And then finally, if you eliminate the hazard, which in this case is mixing with vehicles, um, you have things like shared use paths, rail trails, um, car-free districts, like possibly Eagle Street. Um, pedestrian plazas, things like that. And that's kind of at the top of the pyramid in you know, eliminating the hazard that most people see coming from cycling in traffic and sharing the road. So that's how to get the biggest effect of you know, more people cycling in terms of a safe system. Um, someone mentioned uh, traffic gardens. I think these are really cool. We visited one at the National Bike Summit in um, DC last month. This one is at a, a school outside of Washington, DC. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really cool. You take kids out on balance bikes, which are kind of a, they're kind of a new concept. They're bikes where kids learn to ride without training wheels. There's no pedals built though. So you just kind of like push yourself along like a scooter and you learn how to balance without actually using the training wheels. It's super cool. <clears throat> so this, this traffic garden and many like them have, you know, miniaturized, um, you know, traffic markings, crosswalks, railroad crossings, roundabouts, things like that. So. I would love to see one of these in Berkshire County. Um, I think we could get it done. We would just need to work with a school and, a, and a, an enthusiastic uh, 
uh, principal of the school. I think I think it could happen. So um, I'm gonna look into it. Keep an eye out. If you know anybody at a school who would want to see one of these, let me know. Because <laughs> I think it'd be a really good first introduction for kids to learn more about traffic safety and cycling before they reach, you know, drivers that age. Because it should start as soon as possible. Because people are, you know, taking their kids to, to school and to work, and they're learning about traffic safety usually from the back seat of the car. But if you can get them out and learning already actively before that, hey, you know, that's even better. <clears throat> so now in terms of incentives. How do we incentivize more people to cycle? How do you make it an easier and cheaper choice to ride your bike as opposed to, say, drive? And I think that comes in a lot of flavors. Like, for instance, putting my bike on the train when I take the Amtrak to go to Boston. Or if I put my bike on the bus, if I'm going to my, my friend's house or my, my relative's house on another part of town. You know, I can um, take my bike off the bus and ride the last mile to their house. Um, good, high-quality bike parking. I can't emphasize enough that high-quality bike parking is super important at origins and destinations, and not just like slapping a, a, a bike rack in the dirt behind the, the back door. Like, not that's not that doesn't count. <laughs> you need you need good. It's quite hard to see because it's so full, but you have like the the half moon style um, bike racks that allow multiple bikes to be locked in different positions, especially if you have say an assistive bike or an oversized bike that gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, and these are super cool. These are ramps that let you roll your bike down the stairs in a dignified way. You don't have to huff it over your shoulder and, and try and walk with one hand on the rail down and, and fall and break your neck. You can just roll it right down the ramp there. So putting these in transit stations, this one was in DC, this one was in Northampton, um, going down the stairs to the rail trail. Like those are just simple, ubiquitous things that can really make it easier to take your bike everywhere you need to go, not just for a recreational ride or just you know certain parts of the county. Um, my one beef with these is that these are very smooth metal, so even if I engage the brake, it still kind of wants to slide down the metal. <laughs> so I like this one better, where it's just concrete molded right out of the stairs. It's a little, little grippier. So hopefully that'll, that'll be more of a standard thing, you know, when they redo these stairs some down the road. <laughs> um, and then finally talking about making it kind of what I've been saying in, in one way or another is making it a level playing field. Completing the streets, making it so every mode is, is viable on our streets. Um, and some of that involves taking space away from cars. And you know, our, our streets, our roads weren't designed for cars in mind in the first place in most cases in the cities. So Reallocating space and making it a level playing field, I think, is the last piece of the puzzle in terms of both um, moving bikes, storing bikes, and getting them through intersections safely. You know, this is a protected intersection in Chicago. So even if you're, say, turning from one street to another, you don't even have to think about it. You just stay in the bike lane. Don't have to mix with traffic at all. Or um, it'd be nice to see a big zoomed out view, but. Protected intersections are great because you don't have to worry about merging in with traffic you know, as you're approaching the intersection. I think there's nothing more stressful than having the bike lanes kind of drop off as you're hitting the intersection and then you're just kind of left to your own <laughs> devices. You know, how do you, what do you do after that? So protected intersections like these are really gonna be a game changer in getting more people to be confident riding in cities um, and making sure that people who drive also know that there's space of, that cyclists have to use that is safe and exclusive for them. Um, bike signals are another option um, that give an exclusive phase for people on the bike to go through the intersection first, and then traffic can start moving once the bikes are cleared out. Um, and, yeah, and then over on this side are just options for bike parking. Say if you live in a, an apartment and have a heavy e-bike, you know I don't want to huff that up three levels of stairs, so if there was somewhere secure to keep my e-bike parked, much like any other family vehicle on the street, you know, that would be really, really attractive for somebody to maybe reduce to a one-car household, keep an e-bike and a car rather than a two-car household, if there was a secure option to keep your bike stored just as someone parks their car on the street. So this is a cool company called Unipod that's based out of New York City. Um, they've been deploying some of these um, mini bike pods around New York City and at transit stations, so I'm, I'm excited to see what they do. Um, I'm sure they're looking to expand and partner with more, more places around the country, so um, I'll be watching their progress, definitely. 
And um, this was a cool piece of news today. Um, the League of American Bicyclists just released their Bicycle Friendly States report, and Mass came out number one this year. So I think they're doing some things that are working. And we need to keep this momentum going. So we beat out Oregon and Washington for the first time. <laughs> and we were ranked very highly in infrastructure and funding, education and encouragement, policies and programs, and evaluation and planning. Um, we've got some low marks still in laws and policies. Um, hopefully that'll be addressed soon. Uh, we still need to pass the three-foot passing law, which is in committee, um, but we're one of a handful of states, handful of states that still doesn't have a three-foot passing law in the books. So that kind of gave us a ding in this in this category. Um, but otherwise, you know, we've really started um, getting comprehensive safety and funding programs going for bike infrastructure, like the Share Streets and Spaces program. We have a statewide bicycle plan. Um, we have a complete streets policy for the state, and towns are encouraged to adopt those. Um, so yeah, we're we're moving in good directions, and I think this this helps enforce that. So let's hope to keep in this in this high rank <laughs> as in, in in subsequent years. <clears throat> so yeah, that's kind of the the four pieces of the puzzle in my view, in how we can build off of our 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 excitement over like our rail trails and. Our, 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 our cycling infrastructure to this point and keep it going into the future to make a more bike-friendly Berkshire County in general. So as you're out and about, keep these in mind. You know, what is the land use of the area that you're in? Is the street friendly for bicycles in more than one way? It doesn't necessarily have to be a bike lane for it to be friendly for bicycles. Um, and if there are bike lanes, are they good quality or are they just kind of painted on there and, and that's that? Are they faded? Do they have protection? And what kind of systems are in place to keep people safe? Um, say with laws in the books, like three-foot passing laws, um, speed limits, and engineering infrastructure investments, and what kind of incentives are available to, keep, to get people interested in cycling? Where are the bike racks? Where can I take my bike on public transit? Um, all these kinds of things, I think, come together to make a more attractive cycling culture in Berkshire County. Um, so that was kind of the history. Um, we started with kind of this idealistic view of what cycling was like maybe back in the in the in the 20th century, um, and so for me the future kind of looks like this in terms of a overall view of a Berkshire bike path. Um, we've got the rail trail so far, and once that gets into Pittsfield, you know I really think the city is well positioned to make a a. a a citywide network kind of based on those four pieces of the puzzle that can get people all over the city in a safe way and um, really encourage people to have this other alternative for them. You know, not everyone's going to be able to give up their car and turn into a, a cycling only household. Um, I'm, I'm lucky I can do that, but <laughs> not everyone obviously can. But if you, even if we can re reduce it to a one car household versus a two car household or just keeping the car in the driveway for a day and going by bike to the pharmacy or to the store. I think those are huge steps forward that we can make in reducing our carbon footprints, our dependence on fossil fuels, our wear and tear on our roads. All of these things come together um, when we think about other alternatives besides driving. So this future, I think, could be really important in getting more people to consider other options. Um, you know, th as we continue south, this is the Lee Bikeway that I mentioned, is kind of in planning through Lee. Um, there's some other old rail beds through the Lenox area that I think are attractive. This is all kind of a concept. None of this is, none of this is set in stone. It's kind of just my, my vision. But there's some good rail beds in Lenox that could connect into Pittsfield. Um, and then Lee and Stockbridge do have bike lanes currently in place along 102, all the way into downtown Stockbridge, which is great. And then the last hurdle we'll kind of be getting from Stockbridge down into Great Barrington and then even beyond into Sheffield and into Connecticut. Um, and all of this ties into the, the Western New England Greenway, which is a route that is running all the way from the southern coast of Connecticut all the way up to the Canadian border. And a lot of that is just riding on the road, of course, um, but I think it'd be really cool to get um, as much of the section, of our section of the Greenway um, to be a real like high quality cycling experience as we can. So 
I'm looking forward to that developing more down the road as well. So yeah, I think, I think the future is bright for cycling. I think we have a lot of work to do, and I think there's a lot of good, um, there are a lot of good folks working on these things now as we realize that there are these other options um, that we can, that we can um, utilize to get more people on bikes and make it a, an accepted and equal level mode of transportation in Berkshire County. So if you wanna get involved with doing more of this work, um, there's a few options for you. <laughs> um, one is the Berkshire Bike Path Council, um, who meets quarterly to discuss these cycling initiatives, um, talk about progress around the county, and to share ideas with other folks around the county. Um, I'll give you my email address after this, um, and if you'd like to be included in the mailings for, for these meetings, let me know. Uh, Mass Bike is our statewide cycling coalition that promotes a bicycle-friendly environment around the state and encourages cycling for fun, fitness, and transportation. Um, they're doing good work at the state level to help get us to that high rank um, with the national, um, the national ranking um, and working to get those three-foot laws and other, other pieces of legislation passed. So definitely follow them if you haven't already to see what they're up to. And I encourage everyone to come to the ribbon cutting for the Asheville to Cook Rail Trail Southern Extension on May 7th. And I think it's at, is it 10.30? Marge? 10. 10. Okay. Yeah. Come to the new trailhead at Crane Ave in Pittsfield at 10 on Saturday. Ride your bike if you want. <laughs> and there'll be, there'll be some pomp and circumstance. We'll cut the ribbon. We'll, we'll, we'll have a lot of some vendors there. Bike shops will be there. It'll be a really cool place to, to see what's happening um, in 2022 for cycling in Berkshire County. And up here in North Adams, there's the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition. Um, the bike collective at the Armory is doing... Um, a bike, yeah, the Bike Collective is on Mondays at 3.30 to 5.30. And I believe they also run a downtown kind of um, bike ride um, periodically. I forget what the schedule is this year, but I, I'm sure a Google, a Google search would answer that. But <laughs> I did not find it yet this year. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. So thank you so much for, for listening. And uh, 